Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ohio Huntsman Podcast with your hosts Jason, Jacob, and Jeff. And this week, Jacob, Jeff, and I talk about the harvest report from the ODNR. So every year they put this report out, there's tons and tons of information in this report. You can learn a lot by reading it. And uh, so we go through and, and pick out some of the more interesting facts, interesting topics, and talk about them. Things like how the harvest numbers are doing and how they're trending, how the youth harvest and youth tag sales are doing, how the straight walled cartridges are being adopted and, and what percent of the harvest they account for, how the the new restrictions on public land where you couldn't harvest does after gun season, how they affected the harvest, and surprisingly how they affected the antlered harvest or the buck harvest, and lots of different things like that. So it's an interesting conversation. We hope you enjoy it, but before we get into that, I want to talk about our sponsor. The sponsor of the Ohio Huntsman podcast is Monster Whitetail Grub, and as you've heard us say, Monster Whitetail Grub is an Ohio-based deer feed company, so they make a a high-protein feed, they make flavored corn, and you can also get straight mineral. Right now is a great time to be getting the feed and mineral out so you can get your trail cameras out there and start watching the antler growth, start looking at the... uh, The velvet nubbins, as I like to call them. So Monster Whitetail Grub is a great way to get them in front of your camera so you can take inventory of what's out there and get an idea of what you might be chasing this fall. If you're interested, you want to check them out, there'll be a link in the show notes to their Facebook page. That's the best way to get a hold of them and uh, try out some of their product. So with that, it's enough rambling from me. We're going to switch over to the call with uh, Jacob, Jeff, and I. As you've probably seen on our, our social, we've been posting a little bit of the sort of the facts or key takeaways that we found from the 2018-2019 deer harvest summary. The, the, it's the big report that the ODNR puts out every year after they've collected all the data from the previous deer season. So if you guys aren't familiar with this report, you definitely need to be checking it out. There is tons of tons of tons of interesting information in these things and it really gives you some good insight into the status of the deer herd the status of the the hunter population what the odian you know you can kind of look into it and you know they they provide a sort of a summary at the end of and a and a forecast for the upcoming season and so you can really kind of get a feel for the direction the odianr trying to go what they're trying to do with the the uh deer population you know if they're trying to increase it decrease it hold it steady you know so it's a really important document and that's why we're going to spend today talking about it before we get into that though i want to talk about our sponsor which is monster whitetail grub so monster whitetail grub is an ohio-based deer feed company so not only are they local in Ohio, but they also try to source all of their product, even down to their packaging from Ohio, which really like, and it's just good product. We've, we've really had good success with all the stuff that we've tried up to this point. So they've got a high protein feed that's got mineral mixed in. They've got a straight mineral and then they've got a flavored corn. So lots of different options. It's a great product. It, now's a good time to be getting mineral out. So if you're interested in that, there'll be a link in our show notes to the Monster Whitetail Grub Facebook page. That's the best way to kind of reach out to them and uh, tell them, hey, heard about you on the Ohio Huntsman podcast, and I'm interested in trying some of your stuff. So with that, let's get into the topic. And uh, I guess to start, right, the sort of big picture, right? The total harvest for the 2018-2019 season was down 7.3%, and that's compared to the previous three-year average, which is important because if you guys heard the the episode, I don't know if it was one or both, we did two episodes with uh, Mike Tonkovich. He talks about, you know, year-to-year differences. I mean, unless they're really crazy, they don't get too worked up about, right? It, it's how are things trending over time? And they kind of look at that that three-year average as a good sort of benchmark. So down 7.3%. Uh, 
I don't know. I, things have been kind of trending down, right? I mean, so another uh, 7.3% by itself doesn't seem too terrible, but, it, you know, at the same time, things have been kind of trending downward. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Total harvest number, it is what it is, right? I don't know. I don't... I don't get too worked up, I guess, about the total harvest number. Yeah, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, just opening day being so rainy can contribute to, you know, a lot of that. Right. Um, you know, opening day is a large harvest date. And with the amount of rain that we got, you know, that really lowered the number of deer that were harvested that one day and i'm sure that can contribute you know is a big factor in that statistic right there yeah definitely and we should i mean because i'm sure mike knows this report front to back you know we should probably see if he's interested in coming on and kind of running through this with us i mean this will be sort of our takeaways but it'll be interesting to hear from his point of view you know what his takeaways were and how he sees the next couple seasons going or, or what's his sort of forecast for the next, next year and the next, you know, say three years or something. So, so with that, um, I thought I had another sort of interesting thing I thought was they break it down by different seasons. So most like the gun season, the bonus gun, the muzzleloader, you know, those things, most of those are down, which resulted in a a down harvest. But I did think it, it was encouraging that the youth harvest was actually up 9.3% compared to the three-year average, which is encouraging, I, th- I, I think, I hope. Uh, yeah, I, th- I mean, it's definitely encouraging that the harvest is going up. But I thought I saw, I'm trying to pull it back up now, but the... Um, yeah, the permit sales are still, I mean, the youth permit sales is what alarms me. I mean, it is dropping off a cliff. Yeah, yeah that was very scary to see that graph. Um, they didn't actually go in and break down the numbers anywhere that I saw in the report. Um, they just graphed it out. Yeah, I just see the graph here, and it's a pretty steady, steep decline. What looks like the last five or six years, it's been pretty sharp. Yeah, with the rough numbers that I kind of pulled off that graph, it looked like uh, youth tag sales were down about 30% from five years ago. Wow. Which is pretty staggering. You know, and that's, it's interesting too, because you're starting to hear some of these, you know, deer advocacy groups, the QDMAs and the National Deer Alliance, you know, while they while they're still talking about youth and getting youth involved, you're you're really starting to hear talks about getting adults involved, either people that used to hunt and then getting them back into hunting or people that are coming to hunting for the first time as an adult, because those are the people with the means to hunt. Right. If, it, if a youth doesn't have an adult to take them hunting, then they don't go hunting. And a lot of times, once they've aged out of the the youth thing and they're a young adult, you don't have a lot of disposable income, you know, maybe the the access to the, the firearms or whatever is gone. Maybe you're in school, college, whatever. And so you're starting to see more focus on those adult hunters, adult onset hunters, or, you know, people that are coming to it, again, they, another thing they mention is coming to it from the food aspect. Those are the people that uh, I'm betting that you're going to start to see them target more as the years go on because they're realizing that, yeah, while youth is important, without an adult to take them, they don't have the means to go. You know, they they might be in a position where they can't drive. They don't have hunting ground out their back door. They just... It's not really, uh, what do I want to say here? Uh, the model's not working, right? Take take youth hunting, and it's great, but the data is showing that 
those youth aren't turning into adult hunters. Right. Yeah. Right. I yeah. feel like they're, they're somehow, and I don't, I'd have to, you know, spend more time looking into it specifically, but it seems like there was like a lost generation somewhere where there's, because if you look, I mean, your reduced costs, again, same area of the report, reduced costs, resident senior license sales are going up at almost the same rate that the youth is falling off. So it's like the seniors reduce cost senior. I'm not exactly sure the definition of that. I'd have to look it up, but I'm assuming that's younger. If there's such thing as a young senior, but um, somebody that's newly a senior would have a reduced cost versus the free senior license. Um, yeah. I, but, be- I mean, believe that's... with, I believe with the free versus the reduced cost, uh, the free they got away with unless you were already a senior and changed it to a reduced cost. So gotcha. the people who have the free are gradually dying off and being right. replaced by people who have the reduced cost. I got gotcha. you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Then that would make sense because if you look at the numbers, they seems to be pretty similar. Um, but yeah, I mean, it almost seems like, like you said, they're trying to make up for, I guess the people our age, um, they're not, or, you know, a little bit older than we are, you know, we're in our (coughs) early thirties, late twenties, whatever. Um, you know, so your people that are in their forties, that generation that has the kids that are, you know, prime youth hunting age basically you're 13 to 18 year old um they just seem not to be participating so whatever that reason is i don't know what happened but those people seem to not be taking their kids hunting like you said so they need to find a different way to get you know to get those people back involved in order to get their kids involved yeah yeah I thought, uh, I guess along the lines of permit sales, I saw some interesting information about non-resident, you know, because we hear some grumblings about non-resident and stuff. So non-residents account for 12.6% of permit sales and 11.4% of the total harvest. But interestingly, they account for 17% of the antlered harvest so they are i think it's pretty clear it's not you know not that people just figured it out but ohio is a sort of destination big buck hunting spot right that i think that sort of is what you can glean from that information yeah some interesting i saw on that section of the report talking about non-resident hunters was the top five like non-resident states that people come from. And you had your typical ones that you would expect, you know, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Michigan. But then I believe the other two that made up the top five were North Carolina and Florida, which surprised me. I wonder if that is people that have, you know, because it's pretty common for people to from Ohio to move to the Carolinas or Florida, I'd be curious about like the age demographic of those hunters, you know, are those older people that, that were from Ohio that moved to North Carolina, Florida as a sort of retirement, they've got disposable income, they're coming back. I'd be curious about that. Yeah, Yeah, that's definitely what I was thinking about with the Florida the North Carolina completely just took me by surprise. I, that's just not one that I would have expected. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting about the non-resident hunters um, was that they made up just over eighteen percent of the public land harvest. Yeah. Which is three times the rate of residents on public land. Yeah, I saw that. Um, so that's just kind of interesting of, 
Is there just more of the non-residents using public land by virtue of they have to because they don't own land? Or is it some, you know, is it non-resident hunters tend to be a little bit more committed and better hunters overall because they're spending more money to go hunt out of state. So a lot of times they're more experienced or better hunters versus the whole gamut of Ohio where there's good and bad. Yeah. Do you have that? What what was that stat again? Do you have it up in front of you? Yeah, I have it up right now. Yeah. The non-resident. Let me see here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Non-resident hunters accounted for, like you said, 12.6% of the permits, but only 114 of the harvest and 17% of the antlered harvest. And then just over 18% of the non-resident harvest, which was 2012 deer, were taken on public land, which is more than three times the rate of residents, which is 6%. Right. So of the non-resident harvest, 18% was taken on public land. Public land. Okay. Versus residents was 6% of the resident harvest was on public land. Okay. And then the yeah. non-resident well, that... harvest, which not not surprisingly, the non-resident harvest was 64% antlered versus resident was only 39%. But that makes sense because people are coming to the state to shoot big bucks. They're not coming right. here to shoot does. Right. Yeah, what, what that kind of... Uh... I don't know, showed to me, proved to me kind of thing is that uh, the state really should really consider getting more public land or at least protecting the public land we already have because of the economic impact it has. You know, the non-resident hunters that we're getting all this money from, you know, in hotels and food and, you know, that's what they're depending on t- when they come here to hunt. So it kind of, it's a, a stat that policymakers should take note of that if they want to keep getting that source of revenue, they need to protect and expand Ohio's public land. That's a good point. I mean, as much as people want to gripe about non residents, they're bringing money to the state, right? I mean, residents are, they're residents, right? A lot of times, now they're paying taxes and things, don't get me wrong, but they are typically sleeping in a place that they own. They've got a cabin or they're sleeping at home, you know, whereas a non-resident is probably going to get a hotel or pay for a campsite or right. So. A lot of times, eat at the restaurants every night in the area. Right, yeah. If you're sleeping in a hotel, right. it's kind of hard to cook, right. yeah. Right. Do you, either of you know off yeah. the top of your head when they increased the non-resident uh, fees? No, I don't. That's another thing I thought was interesting. Um, if you look at the, this is going back to tag sales or permit buyers, so to speak. Um, the non adult non-resident permit sales have increased despite the increase in cost it that did not decrease the permit sales at all interesting i mean maybe again you're looking at a graph that's not super zoomed in and refined but i mean maybe from last year to this year the adult non-resident permit sales might have dropped by a fraction of a percent it it looks pretty straight like it didn't drop at all right was maintained. I don't have an exact number from last year to this year, but the permit sales have, again, in the last five years, increased by looking at raw numbers here, probably 2,500, 2,500, it looks like, going back five years ago to now. And I know the yeah. increase happened somewhere in that time frame. I think that, yeah, there was an increase in that time frame, but this upcoming hunting season is where they're really going to get hammered. So we'll see what next year's report shows. Yeah, I believe this next season, uh, the price is really increasing. Okay. Um, I think it's a a pretty dramatic jump for them. I could be wrong. So changing topics a little bit, success rate, I thought there I had a, sort of interesting stat here that uh, 
the success rate was th- uh, the hunter success rate was 34 percent which has actually been trending up since like a low point in 2014 where it was down around 30 percent which you know by itself isn't all that interesting but when you look at the harvest being down and and trending down but the success rate is sort of trending up that's sort of becomes interesting to me at that point it's not you know everybody's not going out and getting a deer 34 percent but you know it's hunting again right it's not it's not shopping right so yeah i wonder how much of that has to do with the guys who are still hunting are more for lack of a better term hardcore or you know the guys who are still hunting are at the end of the day better hunters so therefore they tend to be more successful than the guys who have dropped out because they went a year and didn't get a deer so now hunting is not worth it right yeah i would suspect there's something that has something to do with it so i guess kind of continuing in that vein participation success rate participation so i posted about this on social that 71 percent of the hunters bow hunted last season 78 percent participated in the week-long gun season so bow hunting just although actually that's down 71 percent participated in bow hunting that's down from the peak in 2014 at 82 percent but I was shocked to see that it was that close. 71% bow hunted, 78% gun hunted during the week-long gun season. Then the other seasons, uh, 40% participated in the bonus gun season and 41% participated in the muzzleloader season. So if you then continue that, if you kind of dive into, again, participation versus success, now this is not compared to a three-year average. This one was compared to 2017, so the previous season. So archery participation is down 5.3% from 2017, but the success rate is up 11.1% from 2017. So I think, again, you know, I guess that that leads itself or, or leads you to believe that the people that are still doing it, still participating, are more efficient, better have consistent access to good hunting places. But I just, I don't know, thought those were kind of interesting data points. Just kind of made me go, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to kind of, I guess, like you said, follow that and ponder it for a little bit to see kind of what you can dig out of it or figure out what it's saying one way or the other. Yeah. And so I guess this was another thing that they sort of called out in their, I think they called it their did you know section up at the top of the report that uh, one in 2,500 tag buyers harvested the six deer state limit, which is 0.04% of tag buyers filled the six deer state limit. So not a lot. <laughs> right. There's not a lot of guys just, uh, you know, there's just not a lot of guys that are shooting six deer, which, you know, there again, if you believe everything you read online, everybody's shooting six deer. And, you know, why do we have six deer bag limits? And, you know, I, I just, it was interesting, you know, to have had those conversations with Mike and hear some of the things that he keyed in on and then to see some of that highlighted in this report, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, OK, I see what you're, you know, you talked about that. Like, this must be something that they hear a lot for them to put it in the the big red box at the top of the report saying, did you know you know, they've pulled these sort of key data points out that the six, the six deer state limit isn't affecting the harvest. Almost nobody 
is filling the sixty year state the sixty year state bag limit. So it's not a, it's not really a factor. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that again, that goes back to like conversation like you said we had with Mike. It's just I I mean the sixty year four deer, five deer, you know, if you go back to the, I don't remember the exact number that he used, but most guys, I mean, cap out at two. Two, yeah. And if you go up to three, it includes like 99% of hunters. Right, yeah. You know, shoot three or less. So it's just, I mean, that six number, everyone likes to jump on it. Oh, no one needs six deer. Nobody needs to harvest six deer. That's wasteful. Yeah. But it's just, it's not relevant because guys aren't killing that many deer. Yeah, and I I don't remember those episode numbers. Off. I want to say it's episode 20 and 26. But if you look back in our, for listeners that haven't heard those episodes with Mike, if you look back in our sort of episode archive, you'll see him, Mike Tonkovich, uh, deer program administrator, you know, look for those kind of, keywords in the titles like i said i think it was episode 20 and 26 if you're interested in if you haven't heard those yet you might want to go back and and listen to those because there are a lot of good information in those so anything what do you what else do you guys have that uh you found interesting one stat that i found interesting and i'm sure a lot of this has to do with the limited number of people that responded to the surveys. Um, but with the hunter satisfaction surveys, um, they in there, it talks about, it asks you to say how many days you hunted in each season. Right. And this year, uh, hunters hunted an average of 15 days where compared to previous years, that number was a lot closer to 20 days. So yeah. that, drop off kind of shocked me and i'm sure that has to do with you know the fluctuation that can be you know one person can make when you're getting such few surveys back yeah but it was still kind of a shocking you know that hunters are spending less time in the woods yeah that is interesting i wonder how you know survey data and statistics right it's it, it can get kind of fuzzy right especially self-reported data because i was like well how long was i in the stand what time you know it's it's unless you do it that day and you're diligent about doing it that day things get kind of fuzzy and so i wonder how much of that they factor into those numbers right like how much of it like, have they benchmarked that against other studies of this kind, you know, with self-reported data that if you're not filling it out that day, things start to get a little fuzzy, I guess, is, is for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't have the answer to that. It's just things I think about when, when you start talking about self-reported data data like that as far as how many hours did I do something you know I would tend to I guess I would tend to think that people would misreport on the high side thing like oh yeah I spent so much time but maybe not no now that I'm talking that out like maybe guys are always feeling like man I wish I could have spent more time and you know so like I don't know I only had so it's probably only out there three hours I had to come back you know I don't know just uh, makes me wonder these are the things I ponder after reading this report. So, mm-hmm. so other, um, they had an interesting stat in there about straight walled cartridges. So they said, uh, and again, I think this was in the sort of the, the bold highlighted section at the top. They said that, uh, straight walled cartridges have steadily increased since they legalized them. And that they accounted for nearly one third of the youth season harvest, which, you know, there again seems like one of those like, wow, that's quite high. And I, I did see that the um, forty-five seventy is the most popular cartridge 
by far. I don't remember what the percentage was. I wish I had a yeah. I don't that down, but it was. I don't remember that exact percentage. Yeah, it was a uh, lot though. Forty five, forty five percent of the straight walled harvest yeah. was forty five seventy, followed by forty four magnum at seventeen percent. Uh, then four fifty bushmaster with fourteen, then four 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 marland with twelve. Yeah. So by a long shot, forty five seventy is the most popular cartridge of the straight walled cartridges. So now you know if you were wondering. Yeah, and I think uh, the reason this is my hypothesis for why youth are utilizing a little bit more than the adults um, is probably with the 44 Magnum, if I had to guess. You know, that's a good youth round. It's a pretty yeah. powerful round, but with not a lot of kick. Right, yeah. Yeah, because both the 4570 and the 450 Bushmaster, I've not shot the 450 Bushmaster, but from everything I've heard and people that have shot it, it it's got, you know, pretty stout recoil as well. So Yeah, yeah, I've I've only ever shot one round and it was just as hard if not harder than the 4570 and probably twice as loud. And yeah. loud guns isn't good for youth either. Right, yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that number changes over the next couple of years after, you know, people get their hands on the 350 Legend. I mean, I know they said that the straight walled cartridges have continued to trend up, but will the 350 Legend? sort of start to take over some of that share of the 4570 cartridges or is it going to end up being you know people have already bought the 4570 obviously right they're using it and the 350 legend will end up being a smaller stature youth hunter female hunter option as they look to maybe get into the sport or People are buying a gun for their kid, something a little more modern than the 44 mag that you don't need, you know, primarily, don't get me wrong, there are some options that aren't a lever gun for a 44 mag, but primarily you're looking at a lever gun for a 44 mag, whereas the 350 Legend, right, you can get, it, you can shoot it in an AR platform, right, and so maybe it becomes a little sexier a little trendier it's certainly kind of flashy now because it's new and it's sort of the hot thing but i'll be curious to see how it sort of shakes out i guess well uh what's the other sort of new round uh that a lot of people are saying is going to be or is better than the 350 legend do you know what i'm talking about jason yeah, it's um 357 maximum, is that that might be it. That yeah, might be I, it. I yeah. Yeah, that I you know because there's people coming out saying that the 350 legend, you know, that basically all the stats are inflated, which they always are when a new round comes out. Yeah. Um it's just a matter of how inflated. Um so I you know, only time will tell, and I'm excited to see what happens. The The complaint I have with the 357 Maximum is, I guess, other than the softer recoil, like, and I don't know the stats on it or anything, but it seems like it's a just a smaller version of the 44 Mag, right? It's a 357 casing that's, longer is my understanding than a than a standard 357 so i you yeah. know it's it's still a rimmed cartridge so you still got to run it in a lever gun and maybe you get sort of similar ballistics to the 350 legend but the 350 legend has much wider sort of platform options that's i guess that's why i haven't 
because I think the 357 Maximum has been around for a little while. Yeah, I... According to Wikipedia, it was designed in 1983. Okay. But I think people are talking about it recently because of the 350 Legend, and no, oh, it's, it, you know... Well, um, I think a couple of... Before the 350 Legend came out, there was a couple of gun manufacturers and ammo manufacturers that were trying to start a resurgence of it. You know, they were making more guns in it, and the availability of ammo was becoming... Ava- you know, the ammo was becoming available again. Right. Sort of like the 444 Marlin. Um, you know, in Ohio, at least, it was almost unheard of to find a box of that in a store. And now every sporting goods store has it. Right. Did I say 357 Maximum is a necked cartridge earlier? I meant, if I did, I meant a rimmed cartridge. I don't know. I think what. you said that it was rimmed. Okay. All right. I yeah, I you think did. you said it was rimmed and you have to use it on a lever gun. Okay. For some reason, I wasn't sure. I was second guessing myself. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's like that. I personally, that is what kind of gets me excited about the 350 Legend is the fact that it's a rimless cartridge and so therefore it opens up your platform options pretty significantly right i mean it's just like any other round basically for the the gun developers and so you know you're already starting to see it in the bolt guns the ruger american the i think we saw mars did we see mossberg the mossberg patriot or whatever is going to have a three Maybe or no, maybe that was the four. They're coming out with the 450 Bushmaster and the Mossberg Patriot. Yeah, they're coming out with the 450 Bushmaster. I haven't seen the the 350 Legend, which I'm sure I'm sure it'll be there. You're seeing it in the AR platforms. Winchester is obviously got rifles chambered in it, or going to be having rifles chambered in it. So, you know, it just I don't know. It feels like there's maybe more excitement around it because you get some, I guess, more modern platforms that you can run the ammo in. And maybe that's getting people excited where you, you know, where you run the risk is, is this another sort of fad cartridge that is going to, you know, sort of be a flash in the pan, be hot when it comes out. And then eh, it's just sort of fizzles out. And now you got a gun and can't find ammo for it. Uh, You know, time will tell yeah yeah that's a real risk so what else you guys uh any other interesting facts from the the harvest report you want to talk well, about i think i think the big one that we gotta go into is that the public land antler list harvest was down 44 percent oh primarily yeah due to the new regulation yeah yes thank you for i I knew we had talked about that on our our social media pages, and I forgot to write it down in my notes here, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, so that's exciting. I mean, people were complaining that public land uh, deer herds were down, and it sure seems like they've done something to correct it. You know, you keep that in, because I think Mike said that they were going to keep with it for at least three years. Is that, do you remember that Jason? I think that's what he said because they like to sort of work in these, give things time to work, right? What's it right. going to do? We need to see, you know, one year could be sort of dramatically influenced by weather or, or something, you know, and so right. let's give it three years to run and sort of reassess at that point. Yeah. So I think that, uh, the deer herd will be rebounding on public land. Um, yeah. Because that's a that's a huge decrease in antlerless harvest. Yeah. Which, you know, everybody's always got something that they can complain about. And, you know, you see 44% down, you go, oh my gosh, you know, but this is by design and it's, short-term pain for hopefully long-term gain, right? I mean, we're going to, 
rebound, hopefully, that's the plan at least, that they're going to rebound the population on public land to increase that that opportunity, right? And it, you know, if the biology says they they have they reproduce in sort of a 50-50 buck to doe ratio, so you're not, you know, you're not only talking about more does, but you're definitely talking about more bucks to chase around. And so, I don't know. That's it's like I said, it's can be a tough pill to swallow at first, but if you right. think about it, it's good. Yeah, definitely, you know, is tough in the meantime because, you know, that's deer that aren't in people's freezer, you know, that's, yep. you know, for people that are hunting for strictly meat, that's, those are deer that, that aren't in the freezer and deer and, you know, meat that's going to need to be bought at the grocery store instead of, you know, harvested off the land. Yep. So it's it's definitely, you know, tough in the meantime, but hopefully it will make it, things a lot better in the future. Well, and I, I I wonder if people will shift their, you know, people that were sort of using public land to get their their does, their freezer meat after gun season or after they shot their buck. I wonder if they'll shift their tactic you know, next year, now that they've had a year where they're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to sort of try to front load the season and then it didn't happen. You know, are they going to try to sort of front load and get their dough harvest out of the way? Because I've got all season to get my buck. I need to get my freezer filled first because after gun season, uh, you know, if I don't have private ground to hunt on, I'm out of luck. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. That's definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah. You know, I, I still think that's a, a good way to change hunter behavior because the earlier in the year you take the does, you know, the deer that you're harvesting off the landscape, the more food is left for the rest of them. Right. So it's still should have a, you know, beneficial effect on the population. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll the be thing, curious. I was just going to say, I'll be curious to see what the, how the doe harvest on public land trends next year. So here's something along the public land harvest to chew on that I just kind of pulled out of the report, I had a note here. And in the report, it specifically says for reasons not completely understood So how about we try to understand and see what we think. The antlered harvest was 21% down from the three-year average. Yeah. So what do we think, what do you guys think possibly could have contributed to that? I mean, not to diminish that the doe harvest was down 44% because it was still doing quick math, 23% lower than the buck. You know, I mean, it's still decreased another 20 some percent. So obviously the regulations are working. Um, but I wonder why the antlered harvest was 21 percent lower other than um, if you look down into the season preview for next year, they just they said that the anticipated harvest was low for this year. And they put that on traditionally high harvest dates had unexpectedly bad weather. Right. AKA opening day was a monsoon. Yep. You got um, wet for sure. <laughs> so, and I think if I remember, I think Mike kind of alluded to that when we talked to him after muzzleloader or about, you know, we, we did one sort of toward the end of deer season with him in February there. Yeah. And, uh, I think he kind of alluded to that and, I think at that time they were sort of shocked by that result. And I'm and I think he maybe mentioned something about this where you know, sort of unexpectedly, well, if I can't shoot a doe if it walks by, then I'm just not gonna go, you know, to, to, to public land to hunt. I'm gonna right. go somewhere else if I if I can. All right. If I have yeah, that, that option. That would make sense because it's strictly severely restricting 
your opportunity, I guess, on public land, which was the intent. Right. Um, so instead of going to sit in a tree stand and having to wait on the one elusive buck you get for the year versus if I go sit in this stand and nothing comes by at last light, there'll be does everywhere. I'll just shoot one. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's all speculation. Right. Because I guess, I don't know. I'm just trying to like get into my own sort of psyche, right? If I was making a trip to public land after you were no longer allowed to shoot does, would I choose not to? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at that point, for me, I, it would personally impact my decision of where to hunt. If I had an equal opportunity between private and public, if it was after gun season and I still had to put a deer in the freezer, you know, I mean, I would take public land would fall below private because it's much less opportunity. Right. You know what I mean? So if you have the opportunity at that point to hunt, private land even if it's you know you know on that private land there's no monster buck and on public who knows what's going to come by it's still i mean you have a you can't shoot a doe so it and the bucks are by nature a little tougher to kill than the does yeah and i mean i'm I, i guess i'm sort of assuming too that people are trying to shoot a an older larger buck but you know there could very well be people that i don't care i'm just putting meat in the freezer and if i can go to private land and shoot either or go to public land and i can only shoot bucks well then i'm definitely going to private because i've i've increased my odds right i don't care that it's a if it's a small buck big buck whatever i just need meat for the freezer well then i'm if I have the option to go to private, I'm going to private. Right. Especially late in the season, like you said, after gun season, when it's restricted down to no does. Right. I mean, your opportunity goes significantly down. I'd be curious to see how the numbers, I mean, I know it's not apples to apples. You can't really compare the two because it's different times of the year and different seasons, but um, the amount of people hunting public land, I'd be curious to see how that changed throughout the season. Like opening day, how many less guys were there on public land than the year before because of the regulation? Day one of gun season, how many less guys? And then, you know, after gun season, did the number of guys hunting public land drastically drop off compared to previous years at that same date because of the regulation? I'd be curious. Well, and I I think the only way to get that information I guess would be from those hunter surveys or by you could nobody, sort of the hunter look, surveys that nobody does right yeah that nobody fills out and returns um you could I guess you could sort of look at it by reported harvests on public versus private as compared to years prior right you know that it it wouldn't be a direct correlation to the number of guys hunting, but you could sort of probably infer that if those numbers, if the only thing that was different was the restriction in, which it never is, right? There's weather factors that are different every year. Right. But from a regulation standpoint, the only thing that was different was the change in the, the restriction on doe harvest. You could maybe make some... I don't know, hypotheses from that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because I I agree with you. I think if you were able to kind of conclude some sort of a outcome from that, I bet you after gun season, the pressure or the amount of hunters, the hours hunted on public land after firearm season, I bet decreased pretty significantly. Yeah. Yeah, so anything else then after that that uh, you guys had in your notes that you want to talk about? I don't think I I had anything else. I Um, think the other thing that was 
very encouraging that I saw was they break down the harvest by yearling, sub-adult, and adult. You know, what percentage of the harvest fell into each one of those groups. Right. And in the past three, four years, that yearling uh, number has been, percentage has been really dropping off to where this year it was below 40%, I think. And that adult and sub-adult has been coming up. Yeah. So it's, I think it was close to 30% of the uh, deer harvest was adult, you yeah. know, which is three and a half years or older, I think two and a half years and older. Um, so that's encouraging. I mean, that means that the health and the age class of the herd is going up, which is always good. Yeah. And when I saw that, I I was just looking at the graphs and I was like, come on, is this like, you know, because they ask for antler points and things when you check a deer. Like, are they somehow trying to correlate antler points to age? I, I thought the general consensus was that doesn't really correlate. Like, how are they getting this information? But if you read in the report, they're actually sending field officers to um, butchering butchering sites, butchers and, you know, people that will butcher deer and they are doing, I think, I'm not sure how they were, were they looking at the teeth, the wear on the teeth? Is that how they were aging them? They're somehow aging them though, but it's not just like self-reported like, oh yeah, that that's a three and a half year old buck that I shot or, oh, you know, it's not an antlers thing. They were, they're sending sort of a trained field agent to these butchering facilities to, you know, where people are taking their deer to have them butchered. And those people are looking at the deer that are there and aging them. That's how they're getting those age breakdowns. Because when I originally saw that, I was like, what? How on earth? Is this some kind of phony, like, you know, again, self-reported? Like, oh, yeah, it was a monster. It was a nine-year-old deer, you know. or But right, uh, right. it's not. It's actually, you know. Yeah people that know what they're doing <laughs> yeah i think they were doing uh tooth wear analysis okay which is fairly accurate um the the most accurate way to age a deer is by removing the teeth taking a cross section of the tooth and looking at it under a microscope for something called cementum annuli which Basically, a deer's tooth kind of grows like a tree. It gets rings. Um, so if you take a cross-section, a very thin cross-section, and look at it underneath a microscope, you can count the rings, which correlates to age. But uh, that's that would be too cost-prohibitive, I think, for them to you know, get the age class doing that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, they're and I'm no biologist, but just from what I've read and heard, right, I think that, you know, for a field aging, that tooth wear is a, is a generally accepted sort of good aging practice to, to give you an idea of how old a deer is. I mean, some of that obviously is going to depend on their diet and whatnot, but is, you know, as far as how much they're, how much wear they're seeing on their teeth. But my understanding is that's sort of a, a generally accepted way to age a deer that's relatively accurate. Yeah. And I think where you start getting into, I mean, particulars, I guess, is when you start aging differences between adult deer. So a four year old versus a five year old versus a six year old. Right. And in this, yeah. in this case, that's all in the same category. <laughs> right. We're basically yep. saying yearling, a sub adult, which is, a two and a half year old and then adult. So anything older than that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Cause it's extremely easy by looking at the teeth to identify the difference between a yearling and a adult, um, because of the number of exposed teeth. Um, with that, that sub adult category sometimes can get a little hazy. Um, with you know how much is exposed 
but it's very easy to pick out the yearlings versus the adults in that way. Right, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't have anything else. You guys have anything else you want to touch on? No, I don't. No, I think that basically covered everything. Okay. Well, like I said, there's there's tons of little nuances and details in there that you can, you know, we could be here for hours and hours going over every little data point and fact and county harvest numbers and, you know, so I encourage everybody to to download this report and read it for yourself. There'll be a link in the show notes to this for you guys can so you can find it easy. Download it. It's a PDF. You can print it out if you want. Check it out. And uh, edumacate yourself. It's interesting stuff. So with that, if you guys are enjoying the show, biggest thing is share it. Share it with your buddies. Tell people about it. Just uh, get the word out. That's the biggest thing you can do to help us. If you're interested, you can get some Ohio Huntsman apparel. There's a link to that in the show notes. We've got Eat Local t-shirts, sweatshirts, and hoodies. It's a, got the outline of the state with the nice buck standing there. It says Eat Local. So you can get some of those. Those go to help support the show. And uh, another thing you could do if you're interested is leave a review. All the reviews and, and all of that help. And subscribe to the show while you're at it. That way you're getting notified about new episodes. And I think that's everything. So with that, I want to thank everybody for listening. Mm -hmm.